Hi, this is Guy Wallace. And today in this video series, A Chat with Authors, we're going to talk with Miriam Nealon about her book, co-authored with Paul Kirshner, Evidence-Informed Learning Design, published earlier this year, back in February of 2020. Before we launch into discussing the book, Miriam, would you please introduce yourself and give us a little bit of background about you? Of course. And hi, Guy. Thank you so much for the, for the invite. Um, yeah, so my name is Miriam, and um, currently I work as the head of global learning design and learning sciences for Novartis, uh, but today I'm here as myself, uh, just as a disclaimer. Uh, I started this job about four months ago, so that's still brand new, but uh, my remit is there to uh, kind of like improve learning design overall, you know, at an enterprise level at Novartis. Um, looking for you know the, the good examples and the and the things that can be uh, improved overall um in this career i've been like working as a learning professional for over 15 years before that i was a speech therapist working with children with neurological disorders um and then i started uh, studying learning sciences so i am one of the rare ones i think with a more formal background in uh, learning and training and uh, yeah my career overall uh, you know has been a lots of different types of instructional design work e-learning development work and then moving to more like strategic roles more like leading the design uh, processes um, my previous job was with Accenture as a learning experience designer and I've also worked as a, more like an applied researcher before that which I really enjoyed um, so yeah, that's a little bit about me. I live in Dublin uh, and I'm Dutch by origin. Probably you recognize the accent, although it's a bit of a mess uh, by now. But <laughs> a mixed accent, I guess. Well, yes, I guess uh, let's, so. so let's discuss your book, Evidence-Informed Learning Design. Who is it for and, and what was your motivation for writing it? So it, it's for like basically any uh, learning professional, you know, at any stage of their, their career. And the purpose of the book is, I guess, to help them focus on, on the right things, what we think, think are the right things, and to help them build like a, a strong knowledge foundation um, based on scientific evidence. That's a big, like the biggest, you know, like red thread throughout the book. Hence, I guess, the title, Evidence Informed uh, Design. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it, it discusses a lot, a lot of different uh, scientific evidence and, and different types of research, but in the end, it is really meant to help people improve their practice in learning design. And I I wanted to say profession, but to be honest, I don't think we are a profession. So I, I keep talking about practice just to be on the safe side. <laughs> That's so true. Um, yeah, it is a controversy. But let's let's let me zero in on, you use the phrase evidence-informed versus um, a more familiar phrase, evidence-based. What, yes. What's your reasoning behind that? Well, this is, this is um, coming from Paul, uh, Paul Kirchner, my, my co-author. Um, and, and it's because like evidence-based practice is really rooted in medical, in the medical world. Uh, and what they do there is that the type of, of research that they do is just slightly different. They use more uh, quantitative uh, data and it's really about the highest levels of scientific evidence. And in our practice, it's just slightly more subtle, I guess, and also more dependent on, you know, which context you work in. So if you see a study that, that shows quite strong results in one context, you still need to be cautious, you know, around does it work in my context? Uh, as well. So for me, uh, in my practice, how I view it is that I always start with the scientific evidence because it gives me, you know, more confidence that I'm making the right decisions and I know they're informed by research. But I think in the end, we always need to try and evaluate if this is also the case in our context. Very true. Thank you. Um, you, you also in the book just say you're trying to provide a three-star experience. Can you explain to our audience what you mean by the three-star experience? Yes, and, and Paul Kirchner, if you, if you listen to this, forgive me if I'm not like giving like the, you know, uh, 
hundred percent correct story. It it is coming from him, yes. So, but it is I I, I really like the story because it is it has like two different sides to it. One is I don't know if you're familiar with like three star Michelin restaurants. Mm -hmm. So those are the types of restaurants that, you know, I, I think it's something around like worth a detour, like an excellent experience type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so this is where the three stars are, are coming from. And a chef in such a restaurant um, is able to cook up like, you know, a enjoyable uh, dish, um, like a healthy dish, a tasty dish, right? For, for all kinds of different audiences, people with allergies, uh, you know, picky eaters. And, and they're really, really good at that. And, and that, that is because like they're able to determine like which tools and techniques and ingredients they need to use to, to, to come to the best results. And they're able to do that because they have like really deep conceptual knowledge around those tools, techniques, and ingredients. So they know which, you know, um, pots to use or, or which herbs to use or which uh, cooking techniques, like do they need to cook it or bake it or whatever. They just have really deep conceptual knowledge about all these things to get to the best results. And that's what we also need for our learning professionals. That's the idea. Like we also need to have like really deep conceptual knowledge around tools, techniques, and ingredients to then design. And now we come to the second part of it, effective, um, efficient, and enjoyable learning experiences. So that's that's kind of like the story behind the-, the And, you've, and you, you too have a blog that you do that's named this yeah. well, correct? Yeah, and people sometimes say, what's up with the three stars? Why is it not five stars? Well, that's because it's coming from the- Michelin stars and there's only three and that's the max so mm -hmm. yes there's a lot of people who might question that but thank you for that those explanations now let's uh, let's go into the book here and the book chapters are organized into five parts so if you will can we can we walk through the book kind of in that way and you can share with us and our audience a, a little bit about the the chapters in each of the sections of the book so that uh, people will know what's what they might be getting uh, should they decide to pursue the book and, and read it. So we can, uh, I must about, admit. Yeah. So about part one and, and, uh, and the first couple of chapters. Yeah. So what I was going to say is uh, I kind of realized that, you know, you put a lot of effort into writing uh, your book and then uh, sometimes you forget about all the stuff that's in there. And, and I use it quite regularly myself to, to write new things. And then sometimes I'm still surprised and um, pleasantly surprised about the good stuff in there. So I am going to, to, um, to cheese a little bit every now and again and, um, and peek. Please do. So the book has like five uh, parts. Uh, part one is around building, building the foundation, as we call it. So that's around, you know, the building the foundation for uh, evidence-informed learning experiences. And then part two is more focused on how can we uh, improve? Uh, how can we open our eyes, like, uh, for the evidence that we, that, that we have um, available to us? Part three talks about uh, myths and and, and fallacies am i pronouncing that correctly part four is quite uh practical as in it really dives deep into uh the tools techniques and and ingredients and then part five is around self-directed uh, uh and self-regulated learning uh because i think that is you know that is quite overlooked sometimes uh in our field and it and it's really important as well so that you want to kind of like dive deeper into each. Well, uh, so help us uh, help the audience understand again, why they might want to take a harder look at the book, purchase the book and, and study it. What, what are some of the key takeaways? I, I, I really enjoyed the book. I read it when it first came out. I, I wrote a blog post about it. I really felt that this is a, a book for new practitioners to get them on the right track at the very beginning of their career. Um, and so I thought I thought it was extremely valuable, um, but but 
but share with us a little bit about uh, some of the key takeaways, some of your favorite parts of the book, perhaps. Yeah, I just do want to add as well that I think it's also for more seasoned practitioners and even like managers as well, because I, I think what what happens is um, that even people who are very experienced don't always realize uh, that there is actually a lot of, lot of like research that you can use to to become an, an even better practitioner. And for, for team managers, I think it's good to know that this evidence is out there for your um you know, for, anyway, that, that's, I just wanted to add that. Um, I think that's important. I, I think that is a good point because there are many people who practice in the field who are not formally trained and they fall prey to superstitions and fallacies, as you said, that, that, you know, we need to address, we need to do a better job. And I think this book really will help all sorts of people, but I don't think it's reserved for people with, with a lot of experience. So that's what I meant by yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. So, so again, share with us some of the some of the, the key parts of the book that you think you know may be most meaningful to a majority of our your potential audience. Well, I think first of all uh, that the book discusses um, why this is important, and you kind of touched uh, on it. You know, like what we see a lot is that we still make a lot of design decisions based on intuition, based on beliefs, based on preferences, based on our own experiences as a learner. And, you know, many people in L&D end up in, in a job, you know, in learning and development without even knowing sometimes that there is such a thing as the learning sciences that we, you know, there's, yeah, th there was a post on LinkedIn and I, I won't name any names because it doesn't really matter for the point I'm trying to make. But last week there was uh, a post about, let's change the definition and you just see that a lot like let's innovate this let's change that without realizing that there is a long history of research you know that's out there that and and that concepts are actually really well defined already and then people pick like a bad definition and then say well we need to change this well yeah but there's like 60 years ago there was already this guy or gal or whatever over here so i think you know point one becoming aware that there is like long history i think it's about 70 years now that we have a history um to to kind of know what's what's out there and that there is such a thing as uh, the learning sciences is, is one so we discussed that in the book um and we give like loads of examples um for example skinner's teaching machine right which is one of the first examples i guess of learning technology so that's another example of okay you know 60 years ago or whatever uh there was already this i don't know i might have the the date wrong now so so forgive me um but long a long time ago um so we also discuss a little bit you know what a learning experience is and 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 also because there are like many discussions around what are we called like are we instructional designers learning designers learning architects and we kind of say well it doesn't really matter as long as it's clear that we're a here and, and you discuss that a lot in your work as well right but but like that it's about solving a performance problem in the workplace and whatever needs to be done that's what we should be doing if it's a, around like knowledge skills and, and attitudes so whatever needs to be done and that's what you need to design for period um then we now i have to peek a little bit one second um yeah, another thing, and, and that's part of this, like the backbone of learning design that, that, that discusses that it is focused on the performance problem or should be focused on the performance problem, but also that you need to really know your audience. I think we need to um, spend a lot more time talking to the people in the organization to really understand like what their jobs look like, what they already do. You know, sometimes people find workarounds that we're not even aware of so i think that's really important also what does success look like how do we need to evaluate and we're not discussing how to actually do that in in the book because i think that's a completely different book um 
but you need to really think about how to evaluate at the very start of the process and not, you know, kind of like as an afterthought. So I think that whole like backbone, what I call it, of learning design is, is really important as well. We give a lot of examples around um, the lack of evidence. So kind of like uh, in, in, in the third part of the book, we talk a lot about different myths, such as um, anything neuro. Um, and that's, of course, a bit of a generalization. But there is a tendency to hype up things uh, by just pasting neuro in front of it and then say uh, that that's really valuable. And um, I saw a really great Twitter post yesterday, actually, where um, where she talked about dumbing down neuroscience. And that's, I think, what we do a lot in, in L&D. Like we, we simplify and generalize neuroscience research and it doesn't have anything to do with, with human beings uh, uh, and learning. Um, also, learning style. So uh, we discuss in detail the research out there that really shows, A, what you would need to do to prove that a learning preference actually helps people to learn more effectively. So we discuss like the experiments that have been done and we then show that the answer is, well, no, there is no research out there whatsoever that shows that following preferences helps you learn more effectively. Uh, things like, you know, Google and, and how Google cannot or can only replace certain types of knowledge. Uh, 21st century skills we discuss as a, as a myth. Um, and, and the whole part around logical fallacies, which I won't discuss here in detail, but I think what's interesting about that part is that we use a lot of examples that I think people will definitely recognize, like from from uh, practice, like, you know, the way your stakeholders um, ask you for things uh, and the way they reason. I think people would, would recognize that. Um, what else? Well, I think like the, the part four, as I was saying, the tools, techniques and ingredients, I think that is really um, useful for people. Um, especially, um, you know, the, the, the research around like space learning, um, interleaving, but also uh, worked out examples to me, worked out examples are very underutilized. And I've actually come to realize that those are like a, a golden nugget in my treasure chest. Like if, if you are able, like, you know, after you've determined that you have a performance problem that requires training and you're dealing with a complex task, which is, I think, safe to say in the organizations that we work for, that most of the time that if you need training, then you're dealing with a complex task. That if you're able to find a stakeholder that's willing to work with you, create a worked out example, it just gives you like the whole backbone for the rest of your training so um to me that's one of the really valuable um parts in, in the book uh feedback i think is talked a lot about but uh, i think we've done a, a good job in the book of really discussing the research around it and when to use what type of feedback and what for um that's one now i have some going to cheat again a little bit what else? What good stuff? Is there any particular bit that you enjoyed uh, best, Kai? Well, I uh, it, it was what I liked is that it pulled together in one source document, if you will, a lot of things that I've been taught informally over the years at conferences and from my network of, uh, of mentors, if you will, people like. Uh, Dr. Richard E. Clark, Dick Clark, who you who wrote the forward for your book. I, I know that he really liked your book. He and I discussed it, I think, in one of the videos that I've done with him. But but I just thought it was it, it's it's great as a as a resource that in you know in one document in one book here you cover uh, a great deal of issues that our profession or practice face. And uh, there's because there's so many people that are accidental. Uh, trainers, accidental learning professionals, 
um, that this is this serves their needs, uh, regardless of how long they've been in the practice. Um, but 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 that's what I like. And I especially like you know going after the myths because I think that those are these are issues that I've uh, uh, made us guilty by association because if we're in this profession or practice and we've got many of us talking about all these myths, somebody out there in our clientele are going to understand that that's not true and that that diminishes all of us. And so yeah. I, I, that's that's just part of what I liked about it, but I did like you know so much of it. But but thank you for going through the book as you did because I one more part, guy. One oh, more part. Oh yeah, the last part. Yeah, the self-directed learning part. And again, I think that is just um, something that we either misdefine. So what we see a lot in organizations is that people, what people call self-directed learning, is where we just offer people like a bunch of content, and then people can like plug and play, and then we say. This is great for self-directed learning. And so I think it's really necessary. And, and that's why I'm really happy that we included it in the book is that we explain what self-directed learning and self-regulated learning actually is. And also what the difference is, because it is important to understand the difference um, because self-directed learning is more at a high level. You know, what is my goal? What do I need to plan? How am I going to track my progress? How do I know where to go for help? While self-directed learning is way more detailed at a task level, you know, so when you have picked your little bits that you're going to focus on to be able to assess yourself as you go, like, am I actually making progress? Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do I recognize when I, when I go wrong? And, and you know, how, how can I ask for help? And I see so many... Uh, discussions on, on social media that show that people really don't understand and haven't read like the research around it to understand what it actually is. And then the next question, how to support organizations to, to help, you know, to support their people better and what we can do as learning professionals to, um, to make that happen because it requires support at so many different uh, levels. Mm -hmm. Which is, I think, one of the reasons why it would be good, as you suggested earlier, for leaders of learning teams and even our clientele to understand, you know, what's necessary. It's not just the sink or swim kind of a, a an approach to just give people a lot of resources and courses and hope for the best. That's that's I, I think you do a good job of uh, helping dispel that. Um, I think especially for the self-directed learning bit, you know, it's really important to to even think about how to involve the business. And I know that's a bit silly because we always need to involve the business. But in particular, when we don't necessarily need training, that whole support structure needs to happen there, like not in our little like learning and development uh, right. bubble. Right. It's a, yeah, it's a shared responsibility and to all, sure, yeah. get all on to ourselves as if we're going to be the saviors of everybody. And really it's a collaboration and we have so little to do with it all. Uh, we can do our part, but it's really our, our learners and their management uh, who need yeah. to step up to their responsibilities in all of this. Yeah. Well, now that you've had some time uh, since publishing the book, to reflect on the whole experience, what did you learn from the writing experience, especially writing with a co-author? Because I've done that before, and you know that's always a bit more challenging than than writing something solo. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yes and no. I would say, well, so I'm very used to to working with Paul because we, you know, we've had our blog for over five years, um, mm -hmm. so we uh, we've got to know each other uh, quite well, and you know, you find a way. Uh, to, to work together and and if you don't <laughs> you quit I guess um so for me Paul is I mean I I I mean I don't want to be like overly humble but I don't know if I could have done it without him in the sense that he is just so knowledgeable that you know like he he has like the really deep 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 expertise um so that made it easier for me in the sense that um, he just knows. 
like you know I would have to read again or try again but he just knows so much more than I do so also because he's very um so I'm first author right so how it worked was I I write and then I send it to him and he gives me feedback um he's very blunt when it comes to giving feedback which is helpful sometimes not pleasant (laughs) so um i've had like you know especially for one chapter i remember that that basically the feedback was like okay you can you can just ditch this like this is this is not good so i was kind of like "Mm," for like a weekend and then i you know then you just start again i guess um I, i can handle that it's it's fine but um I don't know if I would have done anything differently. Um, Maybe I would have planned it at a different stage in my life (laughs) because it was really hard. Um, We kind of joke at the start of the book that, you know, sometimes when you think about writing a book, it's, it can be quite romantic as in, you know, you like go to a little cabin or cottage and, well, no, we just had, we both had full-time jobs. Um, you know, I have two school-aged children uh, and a husband who is not very demanding, but still, right. you know, everybody needs some attention, right? right. So it was, it was hard to, ma- to make the time. And um, the way I did it was I planned it like really, really well. So I planned like four hours during the week some evenings and then four hours or more on the weekend but I really took like blocks of time so that you can actually focus and because you have to focus otherwise um yeah yeah no I mean it, it, planning helps if otherwise who knows where you're going to end up is there another book coming in uh, in your and our futures from you well, uh, not in uh, not in two thousand and twenty one. <laughs> okay. I don't I don't have any concrete plans. Um, I would I would I mean I as I said like I just started a new job four months ago so I need um, first I need to figure out what I uh, what I'm going to achieve there before um, any books are in the future. Well, Miriam, thank you so much for taking the time with us to discuss your first book. And uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, besides your blog post, which I think everybody should begin to, to, to start to following you and Paul in that uh, three-star uh, learning experience. Do I have the title right of the blog? Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. Um, but uh, they should, I believe that they should start following you, especially if you're if you're not familiar with the learning sciences and you want to become more familiar and improve your own practices. I think it's a it's a, a worthy read. Um, but thanks again for uh, chatting with me about your book and uh, have a great day. You too, and thanks for having me. Bye bye. Bye bye.